This presentation is brought to you by the law firm of McGowan and Markling. McGowan and Markling provides comprehensive legal services to public entities, officials, and employees throughout the state of Ohio. McGowan and Markling is very proud to remain among the select few law firms to consistently receive a tier one ranking by U.S. News Best Lawyers, Best Law Firms in the areas of education, employment, and labor law, as well as the areas of municipal, labor, and employment litigation. As part of their ongoing commitment to the common good of Ohio's educational community, McGowan and Markling provides brief presentations on various issues facing educational leaders throughout the state of Ohio. If you would like to schedule a presentation tailored to the unique needs of your educational institution, please contact McGowan and Markling today. Our speaker today is Matt Markling. Matt is the motivating force behind McGowan and Markling's ongoing presence as a leading education law firm throughout the state of Ohio. Matt's wide ranging experience and knowledge in education law makes him a preeminent attorney to advocate on behalf of Ohio's educational community. Matt's legal peers have consistently selected him as one of the best lawyers in America in the practice areas of education law, labor and employment litigation, and municipal litigation. Matt is also among the less than 1% of Ohio attorneys who have earned the prestigious distinction of being renowned as an Ohio State Bar Association certified specialist in labor and employment law. Matt is currently the superintendent of two island school districts, as well as a former elected school board president who has been bestowed with the lifetime distinction of master board member by the Ohio School Boards Association, giving Matt a powerful perspective that has proven invaluable to Ohio's educational leaders. Welcome, Matt. On behalf of McGowan and Markling, thank you for attending today's presentation. Please feel free to submit your questions in the comments section, and I will address your questions at the end of our presentation. For those of you who are viewing a recording of this presentation, please feel free to email me your questions at mmarkling at mcgownmarkling.com. Today's presentation is entitled, Here Comes the Sun, Open Meetings 101, and will focus on several basic open meetings aspects of the Ohio Sunshine Laws. Before we begin, let's address our legal disclaimer. Simply put, this presentation does not constitute legal advice. If legal advice is needed, please contact a McGowan and Markling attorney. Now that we have our legal disclaimer out of the way, let's discuss our agenda. We will begin our presentation focusing on general aspects of the Open Meetings Act and conclude by discussing additional available resources. Please note that links to these additional resources are available at the end of this presentation. In exploring the Open Meetings Act, we will first review the definition of a public body, the definitions of discussion and deliberation, and the definition of a meeting. We will then address various notice requirements and the openness principle, and we will conclude by discussing executive session laws. While a public body is defined as a decision-making body at any governmental level, final decision-making authority is not required to constitute a public body. For example, if a school board delegates even some authority to board committees and subcommittees, then those committees and subcommittees are probably public bodies for open meeting purposes, even if the final decision-making authority rests with the board itself. However, the same may not be true for superintendent and treasurer committees. For example, if the superintendent has a policy committee comprised of administrators, such a committee is probably not a public body. And if the treasurer has a finance committee comprised of community stakeholders, such a committee is also probably not a public body. But in both circumstances, superintendents and treasurers are cautioned to avoid even the appearance of such committees being considered board committees. As a result, strong consideration should be given to excluding board members from attending such committees altogether. Now that we understand the definition of a public body, let's explore the definitions of discussion and deliberation. On the one hand, discussion is an exchange of words, comments, or ideas. On the other hand, deliberation is the weighing and examination of reasons for and against taking a course of action. As a general rule, 
neither discussions nor deliberations include information gathering, attending presentations, or isolated conversations. Now that we understand the definition of a public body, discussion, and deliberation, let's explore what constitutes a meeting. Simply put, a meeting is a prearranged gathering of a majority of the members of the public body who are discussing or deliberating public business. If all three elements are present, it's a meeting. So does this mean that a meeting exists under the Open Meetings Act if a majority of board members prearrange to attend a football game together? No, provided these board members do not discuss school business at the football game. Does a meeting exist if a majority of board members prearrange to attend a McGowan and Markling presentation together? No, provided these board members do not deliberate on school business at the presentation. But in the real world, board members must exercise extreme restraint and discipline to ensure that they do not discuss or deliberate school business with fellow board members outside of a properly noticed meeting. Now that we understand what constitutes a meeting, let's explore how such meetings need to be noticed. For regular meetings, every school board must establish a reasonable method whereby any person may determine the time and place of all regularly scheduled meetings. As a matter of law, all regular meetings are scheduled at the January organizational meeting, and schools typically post their regular meeting dates on their website. Any meeting that is not a regular meeting is a special meeting. As an aside, emergency meetings are also special meetings. And notice the special meetings must include the time, place, and purpose of such meetings. It cannot be overstated that special meeting notices must reference the actual purpose of the meeting and cannot simply reference any business properly brought before the board. For school boards, there's a 48-hour notice provision that is often an obstacle to scheduling special meetings. While a special meeting may be called by the treasurer, president, or two board members, written notice of a special meeting must be served upon each board member at least 48 hours prior to such a meeting. Does this mean that a school board may never hold a special meeting with less than 48 hours notice? It depends. There is legal authority explaining that a school board may hold a special meeting when less than 40 hour notice has been provided only when all board members actually attend the special meeting. For non-emergency meetings, 24 hours notice must first be given to all news media that have requested notification. For emergency special meetings, immediate notice must first be given to the news media that have requested notification. Now that we understand that special meetings need to be noticed, Let's look at a sample special meeting notice. In this example, we know that the time is March 17, 2023 at noon. And the place is a board conference room, which is located at 1894 North Cleveland Massillon Road, Akron, Ohio 44333. We also know that this special meeting was called by the treasurer for the following five purposes. First, considering the discipline, investigation of charges, and or complaints against a regulated individual. Second, conferencing with an attorney for the public body concerning disputes involving the public body that are the subject of eminent court action. Third, considering matters required to be kept confidential by federal law or regulations or state statutes. Fourth, considering revising, amending, and or adopting board policies, including but not limited to policies affecting competitive bidding. And fifth, considering the school law hotline agreement with McGowan and Markling. Although not required, this sample notice also lets the public know that while the board may recess into executive session, all action taken will be taken in open session. So let's discuss the principle of openness. It cannot be overstated that the Open Meetings Act is based upon the principle of openness. As a result, all meetings must be open to the public at all times. This means that secret ballots, whispering of public business, and serial meetings are strictly prohibited. As technology plays an important role in board meetings, it is important to note that this prohibition includes emailing, text messaging, and chatting during meetings. The openness principle also means that minutes must be promptly prepared, filed, maintained, and open to the public. While meeting minutes do not need to be verbatim transcripts, the meeting must have enough detail to allow the public to understand and appreciate 
the rationale behind the board's decisions. The Open Meetings Act provides one limited exception to the principle of openness. Executive session is the only exception to the openness principle as it allows the school board to recess out of open session, but the Open Meetings Act limits the reasons a board may do so. For example, the board may recess into executive session to consider the appointment, employment, dismissal, discipline, promotion, demotion, or compensation of a public employee or official. Note that this purpose references an individual in the singular, not the plural. Note also that the board can only list those reasons that the board is actually going to consider. For example, if the board is only going to consider the appointment, employment, and compensation of a public employee, then dismissal, discipline, promotion, and demotion cannot be listed as executive session purposes. The board may also recess into executive session to consider the investigation of charges or complaints against the public employee, official, licensee, or regulated individual. Note that this purpose also references an individual in the singular, not the plural. Additionally, the board may recess into executive session to consider the purchase or sale of property if premature disclosure of information would give an unfair competitive or bargaining advantage to others to conference with a board attorney concerning litigation, to consider collective bargaining, to consider matters required to be kept confidential by federal and state laws, and to consider security arrangements and emergency response protocols. While there are other limited reasons to recess into executive session, such reasons should be discussed with board counsel to ensure proper application. Now that we understand the limited reasons to recess into executive session, let's discuss the executive session procedures. It cannot be overstated that proper procedures must be followed to move into an executive session, including a motion, second, and roll call vote in open session. Once the board has recessed into executive session, discussion in executive session must be limited to the proper topics listed in the executive session resolution itself. And no action can be taken in executive session. By way of example only, the board does not even vote to exit executive session. Rather, the president simply gavels the board back into open session. To ensure that the topics considered in executive session remain confidential, the board should designate all matters discussed in executive session as confidential due to the status of the proceedings, or the circumstances under which the information will be received. And since preserving its confidentiality is necessary to the proper conduct of government business. By designating executive session topics as confidential, the board also maximizes the extent to which those in attendance may be subject to penalties under the ethics laws should attendees disclose such confidential information. Now that we understand that the board needs to pass a resolution, to recess into executive session, let's look at a sample executive session resolution. In this example, we know that the board is recessing into executive session to conference with a board attorney concerning disputes involving the board that are the subject of pending or imminent court action. We know that the board is also recessing into executive session to consider the employment and compensation of four separate public employees. And we know that the board is also recessing into executive session to consider the investigation of charges or complaints against two separate public employees. This sample executive session resolution also explains that the president will simply gavel the board back into open session upon conclusion of the executive sessions. And this sample resolution designates all matters discussed in these executive sessions as confidential. A board member will now need to make a motion to adopt this resolution. The motion will need a second. A roll call vote will then be taken in open session and if the resolution passes by a majority of the board members present, the board may properly recess into executive session. While this presentation provided helpful information on the Open Meetings Act, there are other excellent resources available to educational leaders. For example, the Ohio Attorney General recently issued a free publication entitled The 2023 Ohio Sunshine Laws, an Open Government Resource Manual. The Ohio Attorney General also provides online responses to frequently asked questions, online informational videos, and free online training. 
McGowan and Markling also provides updated legal blogs and school law newsletters, which you can subscribe to at McGowanMarkling.com. Our school law hotline is another valuable resource for educational leaders. As part of our ongoing commitment to the common good of Ohio's education community, McGowan and Markling offers all eligible Ohio educational institutions with five hours of pro bono legal services per calendar year through our exclusive school law hotline. As a result of this commitment, the Ohio Supreme Court and Ohio Access to Justice Foundation have recognized McGowan and Markling as providing the most pro bono hours per attorney than any other law firm in Ohio. It should be noted that there is a significant distinction between the school law hotline and any access that you may receive from the legal division of the Ohio School Boards Association. While the OSBA Legal Division may provide you with legal information and resources, the OSBA Legal Division will make it clear to you that they do not represent school districts or render legal advice to districts. That is not the case with the School Law Hotline. By participating in the School Law Hotline, McGowan and Markling attorneys are both representing your board and rendering legal advice to your board. To learn more about the School Law Hotline, please visit schoollawhotline.com. On behalf of McGowan and Markling, thank you again for attending today's presentation. We hope you can join us for our next presentation entitled Good Day Sunshine Public Records 101, which will focus on several basic public record aspects of the Ohio Sunshine Laws. If you would like for McGowan and Markling to provide you with a presentation tailored to the unique needs of your educational institution, please contact McGowan and Markling today.